Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all have um, checked your audio and it is connected. With that, I'd like to thank you all for joining our webinar. And this is our, our Nescope Hyplax new product introduction webinar. In this webinar, I'll be going over um, the agenda of the webinar is I'll start with a brief overview of the technology, then introduce the RNAScope assay, Hyplex. We will review the product configuration and some data for the assay. I will also go over the essentials for getting started with this assay. I will share some feedback that we've gotten from our early adopters, and then my colleague, Ms. Jyoti Patak, will go over the applications of the RNAScope Hyplex assay in detail. With that, here is a brief introduction of the RNA scope technology. It is an advanced in situ hybridization technology that allows sensitive and specific detection of RNA in cells and tissues with morphological context. As you can see on your screen, the RNA scope um, requires a 20 ZZ pair probe design, that is our standard design technique. It allows single molecule detection of RNA. Any RNA that is longer than 300 nucleotides can be detected using this technology. We offer various levels of flexing, and there are different kinds of chromogenic and fluorescent assays in the RNA scope family. With this, I'd like to give you an overview of the RNA scope assays. The RNA scope assays are assays for tissues and cells which are slide bound. So once your tissue and cells are on the slide, you permeabilize them using our RNA scope pretreatment specific reagents. Then the double Z probes are hybridized to detect the various specific target RNAs. On top of the double Z probe, the signal is amplified, which can be further visualized using either chromogenic or fluorescent assays, and the signal is further quantifiable. What this allows you is it allows you specific detection using sensitive system at the single molecule level in single cells. And this can be applied to virtually any gene, any tissue. With this, I'd like to move on to what HyFlex product is. So the RNA scope HyFlex product actually expands your spatial RNA profiling capabilities to detecting 12 RNA targets simultaneously on a single tissue section. This is our new product where we have a base Hyplex 8 kit, which can be upgraded to detection of 12 targets simultaneously. We also have new Hyplex specific probes, which are required to amplify 12 targets simultaneously. This assay also requires RNA Hyplex specific probe diluent, as well as a image registration software. Here are the highlights of the RNA scope Hyplex assay. It's a manual assay, currently in a fluorescent detection mode only. Signal amplification and detection for up to 12 targets on the same tissue section can be achieved using this assay. It's a very simplified workflow with a single probe hybridization step, no matter how many targets you're detecting, 8, 12, 10, any number of targets, up to 12. This assay also requires iterative fluorescent detection in groups of four targets at a time. So to detect 12 targets total, you will be performing three rounds of iterative detection. This assay also utilizes cleavable fluorophores for Alexa 488, at 0550, at 0647, and Alexa 750. What the cleavable fluorophores um, provide you is uh, an easy way of cleaving the fluorophores and re-detecting using the same four fluorophores. Um, why we have utilized cleavable fluorophores is because cleaving the fluorophores, we've developed a very easy method. It's a chemical-based rapid cleaving which conserves morphology as well as also preserves RNA quality of the tissue. So this is a very quick 15-minute step that allows you to increase your flexing. We don't have any tedious 
or overnight steps of target probe stripping with the Hyplex assay. Um, currently in this format, RNA scope Hyplex is recommended for fresh and fixed frozen samples. With this, I'd like to begin with the most basic part of RNA scope technology as well as RNA scope Hyplex assay. The first key feature is the double Z design of the RNA scope assay. Each Z probe contains three elements. The lower region of the Z is an 18 to 25 base sequence that is complementary to the target RNA. The upper region of each Z is a 14 base stale sequence and the two regions, the lower and the upper regions, are joined together by a linker component. The two double Z uh, probe uh, make up the target specific binding site that is a unique 50 base pair region. And the upper 28 base is the pre amplifier binding site. And it is where, on the pre amplifier binding site, where all of the amplification cascades for the RNA scope technology occurs. For the amplification to happen, the two Zs must bind together on a target sequence right next to each other. With the standard probe design, we have 20 such oligos. It's a pool of 20 ZZ oligo pairs, and it binds to about a 1 kb um, RNA target region. Oftentimes, you may also have tissues that have degraded RNA quality our uh, probes can also bind the fragmented RNA to generate a signal since only three such ZZ pairs are needed to bind to provide a single dot. With this, I'd like to move on to the Hyplex assay workflow. As I mentioned before, that Hyplex 8 um, assay allows you to detect eight RNA targets simultaneously. Uh, what happens once the ZZ probes bind to the target of interest, here each, a, each of the eight RNAs are depicted as gray bars, on top of which the target-specific probes are depicted as double Z. Uh, once the ZZ probe binds the target sequence, the building of the amplification tree starts with the pre-amplifier binding. Uh, once the pre-amplifier binds, it can bind multiple amplifiers. However, it happens for all of the eight targets together simultaneously. Um, this does not affect the sensitivity and specificity of the assay. The sensitivity of the amplification is maintained as well as the specificity, since if only one Z binds, there will not be a signal amplification. Similarly, uh, for the 12 RNA targets together, we have 12 target probes bind simultaneously, 12 preamplifiers bind, and further the signal is amplified. And as I mentioned before, while all of this is happening, there is no effect on sensitivity and specificity of the assay, because we still maintain the sensitivity and specificity by not allowing a single Z to amplify the signal. Once all the probes are bound and the amplification has happened on top of it, now comes the part of detection. So to detect the signal, as I mentioned, we use fluorophores. So once you do the fluorophore labeling, only first four targets are detected because we are only using four fluorophores. As you can see here, a snail-like um, picture as I meant drawn here, can show the fluorophores are attached on top of each single amplification tree, and there are four different colors. Since we are limited by the number of fluorophores that can be utilized together at the microscopy level and can be imaged together without interfering, so we came up with this clever idea of fluorophore cleaving. So what happens at the time of fluorophore cleaving is just the fluorophore is cleaved off. Since the fluorophore is conjugated to uh, an oligonucleotide, that still stays bound to the tree. And the whole amplification tree is still there. So what happens in this case is you won't be able to redetect that same target again. But then you move on to detect your next set of four targets. It's a very specific detection that will only detect your target five to target eight. 
Similarly, if you're doing the 12-plex assay, you will perform another round of chemical cleavage where only the chlorophore would be cleaved off. The whole amplification tree is still bound to the target of interest. And then you detect the next four set of targets. So this completes your iterative detection of the RNA scope hyplex workflow. To show you in a GIF, the whole hyplex assay workflow looks like this. You have round one, which includes most of your time with target probe hybridization, your signal amplification. So this is the longest round and takes about seven to eight hours. After which you detect the first four set of targets followed by imaging. Once you have finished the imaging for the first four set of targets, the slides are decover slipped. The fluorophores are cleaved off using the chemical cleavage. And then the next four set of targets are iteratively detected using the same four set of fluorophores. Once again, the fluorophores are same. However, in each round, they are conjugated differently, so they only detect that specific target. After the second round of detection, you go to the second round of imaging. Um, if you are performing the 12-plex assay, you will have to once again do fluorophore cleaving to detect your third set of four targets. All of this leads you to three different imaging, um, three different images that carry the, all the target information from three different rounds. At the end of the 12-plex assay, you will register all the three images using the RNA scope hyplex image registration software. So as I mentioned before, that the assay is performed in different rounds. So you have targets that, uh, that need to be detected in different rounds. And this is our recommendation for RNA scope hyplex probes um, tail assignments. So as you can see, we do recommend to detect lowest expressors in first round followed by medium expressor in second round and the highest expressor in the last round. This, these recommendations are just for the optimal assay design and to allow maximum interassay comparability. Please also note that each probe tail or probe type has a fixed fluorophore. For example, if you use a T1, a T5, and a T9 probe any time with the hyplex assay, it will always be detected in the Alexa Floor 488 um, flavor. Similarly, T4 and T6 probes will always be detected in the ATO 550 color. Um, I would also like to mention here that although we have our recommendations, there is also a part of the fluorophore brightness that comes into play. So the ATO 550 and ATO 647 are really bright as fluorophores. So if you have a target of paramount interest, I would recommend that you keep them on these fluorophores. With all of this being said, it doesn't mean that there is an inbuilt issue with the assay that we recommend uh, detecting the low expressors first. And for that, I'll show you an example. Here on your screen, you can see same set of four probes were detected in first round as well as in the third round on fresh frozen mouse brain tissue. And as you can see, among the top layer uh, of the um, top panel and the bottom panel, the signal is pretty comparative for all the three targets that have been detected together. So there is not an issue of the sensitivity of the assay among different rounds. Another question that is, is the how efficient is the cleaving step of the RNA scope hyplex assay? So the cleaving step is 100% efficient, and we've optimized it. As you can see here, the signal is shown. Um, the, there's a panel that shows the signal of the unescope hyplex assay. When you don't cleave it, you see some dots. If the cleaving is not optimized, you may see fainter dots. But if the cleaving is completely optimized using the fresh cleaving reagent that comes with the RNA scope hyplex assay, you can see that it's 100% cleaving. So once again, the cleaving is highly efficient, but please make sure that you're using 
the fresh cleaving reagent out of the glass ampule and not a stored cleaving reagent. With this also comes the question is, do, do, does the signal get affected if I store the slides? So this is just an example of that staining, um, storing the same slides at four degrees C does not affect the signal intensity. And as you can see here in the top panel, the slides were stained and imaged on day one. And in the bottom panel, the slides were stained and stored and imaged on day 10. The signal to noise ratio looks pretty comparative and there is no, there is no effect of storing the slides at 4C. Another question that can also come is, does storing the slides at uh, 4C affect cleaving efficiency? And the answer to that is on this slide. As you can see here, I have a positive and a negative control image on the panel here. And this is just a freshly stained slide, and this is cleaved after day one, and then cleaved after day three, and cleaved after day seven. So the slides, the fluorophores are cleavable up to seven days after the staining. However, we do recommend to um, store the slides somewhere between three to five days, because if the slides stay longer, um, in the fridge, uh, the mounting media can be really difficult to come off. So it may have issues when you're trying to decover slip the slide. With this, I'd like to also move into um, a more fuller picture of the comparison between various rounds. Here we are showing four target detection in round one, round two, and round three. So same set of four targets were detected on three different tissue sections. In one uh, set of staining, it was detected in first round. In second set of staining, it was detected in second round. And in the third set of staining, the same targets were detected in the third round. There is no difference in staining, and the signal looks comparable between different rounds. This, once again, um, points to the fact there is absolutely no sensitivity issues with the assay. And we just recommend to detect the lowest expressor in round one for optimal assay design and inter-assay comparability. Now I'm going to speak briefly about Hyplex application. What Hyplex can be utilized for is validation of RNA-seq results, such as if you want to detect multiple cell types as visible in this image here. As you can see, we are detecting DRD1, DRD2, CNR1, and uh, neuronal subtypes using uh, RNA scope hyplex assay. This assay can also be utilized for detecting subpopulation. So if you have one cell type, but you want to see what all targets does it express. So this can also be utilized for this. And my colleague, Ms. Jyoti Fatak, will discuss more about the applications of RNA scope hyplex assay in a little more detail. With this, I'd like to once again um, review the RNA scope assay highlights. It's a manual assay in fluorescent detection mode. It allows amplification and detection of 12 targets simultaneously on the same tissue section. It's a simplified workflow with only one probe hybridization step. It allows iterative detection of fluoro uh, of targets using cleavable fluorophores in groups of four targets at a time. The cleavable fluorophores conserve morphology since um, it's a quick and rapid uh, chemical-based cleaving. It also preserves RNA quality. Um, currently, the assay is recommended for fresh and fixed frozen samples. I would also like to give you an overview of the RNA scope and base scope family of assays. And here's a slide that actually summarizes all the assays that are currently available at ACD. We have chromogenic assays, which could be either single flex red or brown. We also have duplex chromogenic assays. We have three different kinds of multiplex assays. And the difference is basically in the flexing that we offer to our different multiplex assays. As you can see, fluorescent multiplex assay offers only three flex assays. Um, Triplexing, um, the RNA scope multiplex V2 offers four flex, whereas RNA scope high flex offers 12 flex. This is the assay I'm talking about as it is highlighted on your screen right now. The RNA scope high flex utilizes four fluorophores 
but in iterative detections of three rounds. Currently, it's only a manual assay. And we also have our base code family of assay, which is uh, which are required for exon junction detection or point mutation detection or circular RNA detection. So this is only for our highly homologous detection. You can find out more about the products that we offer from ACD on our website. So with this, I'd like to move on to getting started with the high flight assay. What all do you require to get started with the high flight assay? The reagent kit um, that comes for the manual assay contains three treatment reagents, which are your permeabilization reagents, such as protease and the target retrieval reagents. You also get a detection kit that contains all your amplification reagents, as well as the fluoro reagents. Um, we also have a wash buffer in the reagent kit. Um, also, we provide is the high flex control probes, positive and negative control probes. You need to buy the target probes separately. So here's all the ordering information that you need. So for the high flex 8 assay, you only require the high flex 8 reagent kit. However, for the Hyplex 12 assay, you require the Hyplex 8 reagent kit as well as the Hyplex 12 ancillary kit. The con positive control probes are species specific. I've given you an example of three different species here, mouse, rat, and human. We can make it for any species of your interest. Um, Hyplex positive control uh, probe is a mix of 12 different probes. It's actually targeting 12 different housekeeping genes of the species of interest. The negative control probe is actually a universal negative control probe, which is a mix of DAB B. We also have a specific Hyplex probe diluent, as well as the image registration software. These are the recommended accessories for any RNA scope or base scope manual assays. We recommend having a tissue tech washing tray, uh, an easy batch slide for easier processing of multiple slides. Um, high DZ hybridization system. Uh, for target retrieval, you can either use a hot plate method or a steamer method. Both work perfectly fine. We also have the Hyplex assay checklist that actually tells you the reagents or materials that are required from ACD, as well as the reagents and materials that are provided by your lab, which includes general like slides, the mounting media, the fresh ethanol and water and PBS. So with this, I'd like to move on to where you can actually get more information. To get information, you can go on to ACD website, and there is a top strip uh, that runs uh, a tech talks about the major categories, such as products and support and areas of research. You can find out about it there, or you can, on the right-hand side, you can see the downloads menu. You can download from there. Um, you, to get more information on the product, you can go on to the RNA scope Hyplex assay product page. To get any of the user manual, you can actually go on to our support menu. And to find the user manual, you select the assay platform, which will be manual fluorescent assay. You select your sample type that you're working with, fresh or fixed frozen. And then you select your detection kit, which would be RNA scope Hyplex assay and then you can search the appropriate user manual that you would require. We also have an RNA scope specific Hyplex uh, specific brochure, as well as uh, an application note that contains all the scientific data that we have developed internally to, uh, <clears throat> to show the application of the RNA scope Hyplex assay. I would also like to share some customer feedback from early adopters. Uh, we have one uh, from Boston Children's Hospital, and this is the gen image that the customer has generated, and they provided this testimonial for um, their feedback on our scope Hyplex assay. Um, essentially, I'd like to highlight that they said the protocol worked exactly as advertised, and the image registration software also worked pretty easy. I'd also like to show one more feedback from um, Jacob Swanson at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. And he um, also said that he would recommend Hyplex to anyone looking to visualize 
um, distinct population of South. Uh, on the right hand side of your screen, you can also see uh, an image that is also generated by one of our early adopters. I would also like to take a few um, frequently asked questions about the RNA scope hyperlex assay. How many slides uh, is the kit good for? The kit is still good for 20 slides as any of our other manual assay kits. How many slides are the probes good for? Since this is a higher um, flexing kit, uh, and we do think that once you're getting 12 probes on one same slide, you may not be reusing the same target for a lot of other um, studies. So we've actually reduced our probe size, and we are only giving the Haflex probe for 10 slides. How long does it take to get a new Haflex probe? It takes like our standard two week turnaround time, just like any other RNA scope probe. So with this assay, do you require any special kind of imaging system? No, the assay does not require any kind of special imaging system. All you require is a microscope that can detect the four fluorophores that I mentioned before. So what kind of a software do we provide with this? We are providing an image registration software which allows you to register the images from round one, two, and three with respect to each other. Uh, what kind of images does the software require? Um, the software is compatible with TIFF format of images, and we recommend uh, using a 1024 by 1024 pixel size. So how long can you wait between different rounds? As I mentioned during my presentation, the recommended time is between three to five days. We don't recommend longer than that because, uh, as I mentioned before, that if the mounting media dries too much, it takes longer time for the cover slip to come off the slide. Uh, one very important thing is can you use the probes that you already have for the multiplex assay in your lab? Uh, no, RNA scope hyplex assay is not compatible with the probes in C1 to C4 channels. RNA scope hyplex assay requires RNA scope hyplex specific probes with C1 to T12 designation. With this, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Ms. Jyoti Fadak, and she'll take you with all the Arnesco Hyplex application data. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Nidhi, for the great presentation and all that information. Uh, now I'd like to discuss some of the key applications of the RNA scope hyplex assay. Complex, highly heterogeneous tissues such as the brain, tumor, kidney, they're comprised of multiple cell types and states. And the precise characterization of these tissues can enable identification of new cell types, predictive biomarkers, new therapeutic strategies, and even more. However, interrogation of these complex heterogeneous tissues requires a highly sensitive, specific, and multiplex spatial approach with a single cell resolution. Traditional methods for transcriptomic analysis have relied on bulk tissue analysis, such as PCR, which can provide an average level of gene expression in a sample. But you tend to lose the spatial and single cell information. This is akin to a fruit smoothie which can be delicious and healthy, but you can only guess of what is in this smoothie. The advent of single cell transcriptomic analysis, such as the single cell RNA sequencing methods, have now been able to provide molecular information at a single cell level. And to come back to this fruit analogy, can now provide you the menu and tell you what fruit and how much of this fruit went into that smoothie. However, these techniques still don't provide you with how those cells were organized in the tissue context, or you lose the spatial information of these fruits. And this is where spatial analysis comes into play. Single cell multiplexing spatial analysis that detect RNA can provide transcriptomic information with spatial organization while retaining that single cell resolution. So now, instead of an average blended smoothie with mystery ingredients, you can see how all the fruit is arranged on that spatial platform. Initiatives such as the human cell applets require assessing gene expression at a single cell level. 
However, as we just mentioned, the current single cell transcriptome studies, they utilize dissociated cells and result in the loss of that spatial organization of the cell population in a morphological context. And hence, validation and spatial mapping of single cell analysis can now be obtained using assays that retain spatial organization, such as RNA in situ hybridization. The slide shows a great image of this workflow where you can now incorporate spatial analysis into the single cell transcriptomics workflow. The multiplexing capabilities of the RNA scope hyplex assay, coupled with its high signal noise ratio, enable single cell and single molecule detection of transcripts in the tissue context, providing confirmation of very high throughput single cell data and results, as well as adding spatial information to these data sets. So what are some of the applications of incorporating RNA scope hyplex in a single cell sequencing workflow? You can spatially map a cell atlas. You can visualize gene signatures of novel cell types. You can classify highly heterogeneous cell types. You can confirm new therapeutic cell types. You can characterize immune landscapes, identify new immunotherapy targets, analyze or predict response to drug treatments, and also confirm publicly available data sets such as the TCGA and the tabular mirrors. So in the following slides, I will be presenting data from a project that we conducted at ACD. And this project demonstrates how spatial mapping and confirmation of gene signatures can be incorporated into single cell sequencing workflows using our RNA-scope hyplex assay. I'd like to thank everybody on the screen for helping me out with this project. So on the screen, you'll see a paper. This paper is by Goxy et al. published in Cell Reports in 2016, where researchers at Stanford identified novel subtypes of the D1 and the D2 striatal medium spiny neurons, or like I'm gonna be using the short MSN in this presentation. They did this by analyzing over 1,200 striatal cells using single cell RNA sequencing. The methods of their workflow is seen on the screen. They identified discrete cell types that exist in a continuous spectrum of transcriptional states and found that the functional diversity within a complex heterogeneous tissue arises from a small number of discrete cellular subtypes. However, they did not confirm their single cell RNA seq results, nor did they show the spatial relationship of how these two D1 and D2-MSNs existed in a morphological context. Therefore, we decided to employ the RNA-scope technology to confirm these results and spatially map these subtypes in the mouse brain. So now I'd like to sort of dive into what these two subtypes were. Previously, we identified or detected these two subtypes using our RNA-scope multiplex fourplex assay or the V2 assay uh, which gave us the capacity to collect up to four targets at a time. The paper had identified two types of medium spiny neurons. The DRD1A, or the D1 subtype of MSN, was subdivided into two discrete populations, the FOXP1 expressing, or the major population, and the PCDH8 expressing, or the minor population. Using the RNA scope fourplex assay on several sections of mouse brain, we identified both the major and the minor subtypes. Additionally, the paper identified a subpopulation of the D1 major MSNs. They were either MACE2 high or DNAR high, which were also detected using RNA scope fourplex assay or the V2 assay. Each subpopulation was detected on a separate section using combination of four probes. Similarly, to the D1 MSN, the DRD2 expressing, or the D2 MSN, also exhibited the major and the minor types, and the presence of a continuous transcriptional gradient. We detected both the major, or the simpler expressing, and the minor, or the HTR7 expressing subtypes of D2 MSN. Additionally, the paper identified a subpopulation of the D2 major MSNs that are either CalD1 high, or CART pt high, and they were also detected using the RNA-scope fourplex assay. 
Similar to the D1, each subpopulation was detected on a separate section using combinations of four probes. Overall, to characterize all the subpopulation of both the D1 and the D2 MSN, we used six sagittal sections of the mouse brain. So why was this important for us to now use the hyplex assay? As I previously mentioned, we had to do all of these experiments on various sections of the mouse brain, but all of these different cell types were characterized by more than four targets. So we needed an assay that had capabilities of higher multiplexes. And so in order to spatially resolve all the striatal set types in one section, we use the hyplex assay. So because the D1 and the D2 MSNs were each characterized by eight genes, we use the RNA scope hyplex eight reagent kit, which detects eight targets simultaneously and was the perfect assay to interrogate these cell types. Furthermore, we could spatially resolve both the D1 and the D2 MSN subtypes simultaneously now on one section using the RNA scope hyplex 12 reagent kit or the ancillary kit as Nidhi mentioned, which detects the 12 targets. Each panel was run individually on one sagittal mouse brain section, allowing us to visualize multiple targets while preserving the number of samples tested. As Nidhi already described in great detail, and so I'm not going to go over too much, we followed the Hyplex workflow with the Aplex panel run by performing two rounds of four targets each, and the 12plex panel was run by performing three rounds of four targets each again. And images from each of these runs were then registered using our RNA scope image registration software. On this slide, we have registered images from our RNA scope eightplex data that allowed us to detect multiple cell types in the same tissue section, such as the major D1 and the subpopulations of major D1 MSNs that the single cell RNA seq data had identified, which we previously saw using the fourplex assay was the MACE2 high and the D hair high. And you can see those in the insects out here. Instead, now we were able to look at all of these populations on the same section. Similarly, for the D2 MSNs, we were also able to look at the major and the minor populations, as well as this major subtype, which was either CalV1 high or CARPT high. And once again, all of these were done on the same sections. So having the ability to test all these probe combinations on the same slide not only limited the use of tissues but also provided valuable spatial information of these gene sets on the same plane that can usually be lost by performing multiple runs on separate sections. The researchers at Stanford also highlighted an important finding in which they had identified a group of cells that had expressed both the DRD1A and the DRD2 genes. And to resolve further heterogeneity between these two MSN subtypes, we performed the RNA scope hyplex assay with 12 targets to now simultaneously detect these two populations. The following slide you'll see, very beautiful, was created using visual tools to more clearly detect and highlight the data from this experiment. This slide shows data from our RNA scope hyplex assay with 12 targets, where we compiled the images from our, using our hyplex image registration software. With this assay, we could visualize the heterogeneity of these populations on the same tissue section. This looping image was created using online tools to more clearly visualize and highlight the data. And by doing so, you can clearly see which cells are expressing the various combinations of these gene targets. Gorgeous. The researchers at Stanford also highlighted an important finding in which they identified a group of cells that expressed both the D1 and the D2 genes. With the use of our Hyplex registration software, we now have the capability to visualize the specific cells expressing our targets of interest and refine gene signatures by toggling on and off different channels. If you can see to the left of the screen, that's how the platform of the image registration software works. So you can choose on and off for your particular target of interest, and then you can visualize the, the combinations you're looking for. And by selecting for our two targets of interest, the DRD1 and the DRD2, 
we were able to detect the novel cells expressing both of these genes, as highlighted in the publication. Additionally, using our image research software again, we visualized the D1 and D2 major and minor gene groups by selecting for their respective gene signatures, in this case, six targets. To hone in on both the D1 and D2 major and minor populations, we selected for the six genes. And as seen on the slide, we could detect both the major and the minor D1 and D2 cell populations, once again, on the same section. So the DRD1A FOXP1 dual positive cells indicated the D1 major subtype, and the DRD1 PCDHA dual positive cells indicated the D1 minor subtype. You can also see those in the infant. The DRD2 SINFOR dual positive cells represented the D2 major subtype, and the DRD2 HGR7 dual positive cells represented the D2 minor subtype. Once again, all this information came from a single section of mouse brain. So in summary, gaining deeper insights into G regulatory pathways requires the ability to detect a high number of targets within the same tissue section. Using both the RNA called multiplex fluorescent and the hyplex assay, we have demonstrated the capacity of multiplex in situ transcriptomic approach for confirmation and spatial mapping of single cell RNA sequencing results in highly heterogeneous mouse striatum. As you can see in the, in, in the slide, we show the beautiful workflow of incorporating our assay for both in situ confirmation and spatial mapping of single cell sequencing results. With the higher multiplexing capability, we can now visualize up to eight or 12 targets and characterize for these novel cell populations. Due to utilizing this multiplexing capabilities, you can now use reduced sample slides with multiple probe combinations. And additionally, you can characterize these novel cell types at a single cell resolution. Thank you so much for listening to our webinar. If you would like more information or would like to learn about the RNA 